So welcome along to Sporting Lives, where we look back on the career of somebody who has been involved in sport with distinction. Uh, in the case of my guest on this episode, his skills as a middle order batsman with Middlesex saw him selected to play for England and became the first black cricketer to play test match cricket and one day internationals in an England shirt. Um, a native of Barbados, which is where he's speaking to us from today, he was also a pretty talented footballer too, played for uh, Stevenage uh, over here in England. And since his cricketing career, uh, he's also been involved in football coaching to a great extent. In fact, um, a UEFA B qualification to his name. I think he's the most qualified uh, football coach in Barbados. And that leads us nicely on to a book that he's put his name to by the name of Achieving Excellence, a Caribbean Soccer Coaching Manual. The man himself is Roland Butcher. Welcome along, Roland, to Sporting Lives. Thank you, Jonathan. Great pleasure. So let's, we we'll, we'll want to talk about the nostalgia and the, the Middlesex and, and all of that with the cricket in a little while. But let's start with, with what's going on at the moment and this, this football book that you've put your name to. Um, people who maybe haven't seen what's been going on with you since you know, that um, cricketing career that lasted so long back in the 70s and, and 80s, maybe think, Roland Butcher football, but as I mentioned in that little build-up, Biggleswade Wade and, and Stevenage you played for. I know there was also an association as well uh, with Brendan Rodgers. Um, maybe you want to tell us a little bit more about that and, and just how, how football came to be a, a real thing for you. Yeah, certainly, Jonathan. Um, well, just basically, I'll, I'll give you a quick rundown of what I've been doing really for the last 15 years. Uh, the last 15 years, I've been director of sports at University of the West Indies here in Barbados a position that I got offered in 2004 um, to come and start you know, a sports program. So I took the opportunity to come in 2004 and really they started that program at UWI and developed it um, in many sports, not just cricket. Obviously cricket was the first sport because of the culture and the history of cricket in the Caribbean. Uh, we had reasonable facilities at the, at the university, but those facilities were enhanced somewhat when the World Cup came along, where we got a brand new pavilion, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, which allowed us to host a number of World Cup matches involving New Zealand, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, uh, Scotland as well. So that's what I've been doing for the last 15 years, developing the sports program. As I said, we started with the um, cricket, but then obviously we developed the football as well. Uh, we've got a fantastic stadium um, here in Barbados with running track, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So. That was my life for the last 15 years. I retired last year um, when I reached the, the ripe old age of, um, well, at university, you've got to retire for 65, but fortunately for me, because my birthday is in October, it meant I was able to go on until the end of July the next year, so I was nearly 66. So um, it was called time on my career then. And that really led me into finishing something that I've been doing for a number of years. Yes, football has been side by side with the cricket over the years. In England, I, as you said, I played semi-professional um, while I was a professional cricketer. And right also through that time, I started to do my coaching qualifications, um, obviously starting with the prelim and then the um, FA certificate, etc., etc. And eventually, um, later in my career, I did my UA for B license. And yes, I, I did it at the same time as Brendan Rogers. We met. Um, on that course for the very first time. Um, we got on really well. Um, I think similarly, you know, we had similar ideas about how the games um, should be played and coached, and that's why I think we got on so well. And in actual fact, sometime later, I actually worked for Brendan because um, about a year or so later, I received a phone call from Brendan and said, listen, I, I've just been given the job at Reading as the academy director, and I would like you to come and work with me. And um, I said, yeah, of course. So I went to work with him as an academy coach, ran my own team. Um, I was there for a while. Then Mourinho took him to Chelsea, obviously as a bright young man. Mm -hmm. And um, then obviously he went in that direction. I, I went back to cricket soon after that when I went to Bermuda as national coach. And then really from there onwards, um, I was in the public school system in England for a while. But then in 2004, I came to Barbados. So 
From way back in England, I had the idea of developing this manual, but over my time here in the Caribbean, it became even more relevant that it was something that the Caribbean needed desperately. Um, the Caribbean, crazy about football, but um, only one or two players really have made it to the top level in world football. Obviously, I think Emerson Boyce was the last one as Wigan captain. Um, and before that, one other player, um, a fellow called Gregory Lalu Goodrich, who played for um, Queen's Park Rangers, Bristol Rovers, etc. So there have been a limited number of players in the big leagues in Barbados, from Barbados, and, and the Caribbean in general. So over the time at UWE as, as um, director of sports, obviously one of the things that I had to do in my job was to look for talent around the Caribbean in all sports because we developed a, sit, a situation where we were able to offer um, sports scholarships as well um, to promising sports persons. Um, in all sports. So I, I spent a lot of time around the region searching for talent. And I was able to then see firsthand, particularly with football, um, the sort of things that were missing um, in the region. And coaching is certainly one of the things that uh, is a real problem in terms of developing the players so that they are good enough to play at the, at the top level. So right near the end of my time at UE, I thought to myself, I must finish this manual. So I, I put in some time, um, got it um, finished, and it has been published. And really, it is a, a manual designed to, um, to, really what it's developed for is to get the consciousness of, of the, the, the Caribbean careers for soccer, get them involved. Um, it's a manual, as I said, for the Caribbean, but it is relevant really for anywhere in the world. It is, um, it is a wide range of manual that if followed, you know, can make a significant difference. So in terms of its appeal, have you written this book for other coaches of soccer, uh, for players? Is it aimed at schools or does it cover a, a multitude of sins, if you like? Well, it's a multitude of sins. All those things that you have mentioned. Yeah, the players, the coaches, you know, clubs, schools, you know. So really, it covers from age five right up to, to elite. So there's, you know, you're dealing with five to seven year olds, seven to nine, nine to 11, 11 to 13, 13 to 18, and then, and then adults. So really it covers a wide range of um, age groups. Which is not easy from a writing perspective to, to, to tap into that, right? Is it because you are sort of using different language, I suppose, and, and aiming at different things with different people there? Absolutely. And I mean, you know, that has been one of our major problems in the Caribbean is that, you know, coaches have not really identified what is relevant for a, for a particular age group. So you actually find that, you know, coaching that takes place, you know, you're, it's inappropriate. So you'll be coaching a seven-year-old, what you should be, what you're coaching a 13-year-old. And it's impossible really for them to um, evaluate that. So what I've really done is to put it in a form where that, you know, anyone can pick the manual up and the particular age group that they're coaching, everything is there for them to ensure that that age group gets exactly what they deserve. What sort of footballing potential then is there on the island itself of Barbados and in the, the Caribbean, you know, um, to, to develop that on a wider scale? Well, I mean, there's an abundance of talent in the Caribbean. There's no question about it, um, but it's undeveloped talent. That's the problem. Uh, you know, the coaches really have not been, um, at the level to really take the players to the level that they need to be. And I guess also there's a, a lack of understanding of um, the level that these players really need to get to. So it's a situation of being a big fish in a small pond and the coach is not really having the, um, not really knowing what the level is outside of that, that these players should reach. Um, you know, I'm hoping that I can assist them in that to then really see the bigger picture because the careers in the Caribbean for football is unbelievable. But all they're doing is, is watching the other talent all around the world on a weekly basis. Is there, are there many clubs at all, or any clubs, linked up with professional clubs then from elsewhere in the world, exchanges, sharing of information, maybe taking players on and you know, um, letting them have a go with another club and see exposing themselves to, to different levels of football, different experiences? 
Yeah, I mean, there, there were some connections. I mean, Chelsea had a big connection here in Barbados a few years ago. Um, some years back, um, Arsenal had a connection, um, and that really came to the university because um, while I was in England, I, I worked 10 years at Arsenal as a soccer school coach. So, you know, I built up quite a good uh, reputation with them. And so when I came here, I was able to get Arsenal to come and do courses, et cetera, et cetera. Also, in the last few years, uh, we, we developed a, a relationship with the Belgium FA um, and working with the Caribbean Football Union. We got the Belgian FA to come and run some tutors course, courses. The idea was to then develop some UEFA B licensed courses um, in the Caribbean so that these persons who did the tutors course could then you know, assist on the courses. So that was something that we developed. And really, the last thing that I did before um, retiring was I organized uh, MOU between the University of the West Indies and the Argentine Football Association um, through the ambassador for Argentina here in Barbados, um, Gustavo uh, Martinez Pandiani, a really terrific guy, big football man. And um, through him, um, it was two years ago, I went with him to Boca Juniors in, in Argentina, um, spent some, a week at Boca Juniors. And um, really, that has been developed nicely. Uh, unfortunately, now I've left the university, so I'll have to wait and see how they actually take that MOU forward. But I mean, to have an MOU with the Argentine Football Association, and they are willing to come and do things here, take players there on exchanges, coaches, etc. It really is a great opportunity for Barbados and the Caribbean region. Superb. Uh, and Arsenal fans watching this will have probably perked up with the mention of that club's name. Um, I know a couple of um, a couple of young lads, uh, fairly closely related to myself, who both like the club. Uh, wh when were you involved year-wise, and, and who might have been coming through the system? Who did you work with then as a young player that we would know? Well, well when I was um, at Arsenal, the the likes of I mean George Armstrong and those people were still around. Uh, Pat Rice, um, and then obviously later on Paul Davis and. Uh, and Nicholas and Elka, all those guys. So I, I was there when those guys were, were around. Um, I actually was doing some work with the, the first team coach, who was first team coach for a long, long time, Neil Banfield. Um, he was right throughout Arsenal Wenger's career as well yeah. as first team coach. Um, so Neil was someone that I, I grew up with. Um, we stayed very close friends, and about three, four years ago, I actually took three players over um, to Arsenal and spent a week at Arsenal. Um, through Neil, um, and they didn't get taken on in the end, but they were, you know, they were impressed with them with the players. But it just really gave the players an idea of the level that they need to get to. Is that then um, a realization in general in with football in Barbados that you are trying to get players and coaches, you know, to bridge a gap that may exist at the moment with what you've written? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, that really, I mean, I've looked around the region and I've seen nothing like this that has attempted to bridge that gap. So really, um, each coach in each country is doing what he feels, you know, he wants to do. There's, there's nothing really to guide him. And so you end up with some good coaches, you end up with some not so good coaches. Uh, but, you know, hopefully, you know, if they take this on board um, over a period of time, you know, hopefully we will see, you know, the level of players developing um, throughout the region that get their place in the world soccer. Well, wherever you're watching this from, uh, Roland's book goes by the name of Achieving Excellence, a Caribbean Soccer Coaching Manual by Roland Butcher and it's published by the University of the West Indies Press. Um, and I'm sure if you Google that, you'll be able to find it online because there's not many shops at the moment open that you can go into <laughs> and buy a hard copy. Yeah, um, yes, okay. I mean, uh, the, the, the good thing about this manual is that it, it is an e-manual, so you don't have to leave home at all. Really. They just need to, as you said, go online. The other place they can actually go is um, bookfusion.com. Um, so those are the two places they can go and they can get it quite easily. Well, I've been looking forward to seeing some Barbadian players then um, play for some big clubs or who knows, maybe uh, internationally in a World Cup at some point in our lifetimes. And then you can kind of look down as, as that Granddad, that father figure. Well, maybe granddad's a bit too old, Roland, but father figure, shall we say. The, the no, 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 father no. of Barbadian football. I would say great granddad might be about right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can we talk cricket? Certainly, certainly.
Great stuff, because of course, uh, as I mentioned at the top of the piece, uh, you're from Barbados originally. I think you came over to England late 60s when you were in your early teens. Um, That's correct. And, I, came, um, I came in 1967. I was 13 plus. I would have been 14 in October. So what was it like in the first place uh, to hit you know, London? Whereabouts in, in London or the area were you? Uh, where did you first settle? But when I first came to England, I was in Stevenage, actually in Hertfordshire. Uh, my parents had been in Stevenage since the 50s, so you know, they were well established in that new town. So I went to Stevenage, and it was very strange because, as you know, in the Caribbean, you know, cricket is the number one sport, so it's played every day. Where in England, um, football is the number one sport. So I, I came into a country that seemed very, very cold, and also, um, the, the sport was certainly different. I had very, very limited um, ideas about football while I was in Barbados. And really, it was only when I got into England and I saw the passion by the, the players and, and the young people. It reminded me of how I was in Barbados with cricket. Uh, and uh, having been there on a cricket tour myself, Barbados, many years ago, uh, while you were still um, putting on the whites for, for Middlesex, I saw the passion, I experienced the passion um, firsthand from a, a, young, a youth cricket playing point of view. And I can remember actually playing at Holders Hill, the first game we played. Um, and what sort of walking around the ground, you know, we must have been batting and I was down the bottom end of the order. And somebody, a couple of houses, periphery of the ground, am I right in thinking, at, at Holders Hill with uh, passion? match of the day on television and this, this was kind of April time so the football season over here would still have been going on. I can remember thinking they're watching Everton against Manchester United or whoever it was and being really surprised at that because as you mentioned yourself a few minutes ago all you could associate the Caribbean with was, was cricket really at the time um, and that's what I was there for so uh, but I guess as with such as yourself uh, people like Viv, Viv Richards who of course uh, seen talked about as a decent football player I don't know you might be able to comment on that a little bit more closely but if you're an athlete you can turn those skills I guess to several different sports football being a, a prime example absolutely I mean referring to Viv, Viv, Viv was a very good footballer I mean he, I think he, he played uh, World Cup qualifying football for Antigua so you know he was he was a good sportsman all around and you know even during my time you know there were lots of players who played um, professional football and also played um, cricket as well. I mean, Ian Botham, you know, played for Scunthorpe. And, um, you know, at the same time, Ian Botham and myself actually went to MCC Young Professionals at the same time. We were there, 70 and 71. Um, he played for Scun Scunthorpe. Um, obviously, Ted Hemsley played for Sheffield yeah. Wednesday in Coombs. Um, you know, and, you know, there have been so many other players who have actually played the game of football. Ian Gould was a goalkeeper at Arsenal. Um, Phil Neal. So, Phil Neal, Phil Neal at, at Worcester, yeah. So there have been, you know, plenty of, of persons. But as you said, and you would know that really back in the early days of our cricketing careers, cricket really didn't go beyond September. So in those days, there were very little uh, winter touring. So people had to find something to do in the winters. So football was an option for all of us. Um, obviously, touring for cricket became much more popular later on. But in those early days... Um, you found that most cricketers would have played um, football in, in the winter period. So Middlesex, you signed for in, uh, you play your first season for in 74, not sure exactly when you, you actually joined the club, but tell us what it was like then, who was around at the club, was it a, a welcoming place for a, for a young, you know, young black kid from Barbados who we all knew, knew about the, the sort of West Indies side of the 60s and there had been that reputation, the West Halls, the Charlie Griffiths. And you kind of, I guess, come in on the back of that. Uh, Sobers is around. The game in the West Indies has got a really good reputation. Are people trying to knock Roland Butcher off his perch and teach him a thing or two? Or is it open arms and welcome along, sunshine, there's a peg down in the far corner for you? Well, basically, I was at Lawrence, as I said, from 1970 as a young professional with the MCC. So, you know, Middlesex got a good chance to see me while I was at Lawrence. And it was really... Why, why Middlesex were looking at all the players um, and they saw me, obviously they offered me a contract for 19, from 1973. So 
some 72, because I was at Lord for 70 and 71. So 1972 is when I went to Middlesex. Um, obviously, I went to Middlesex at a time where uh, a lot of young players came through at the same time. I mean, there were three of us from that MCC on professional side that went at the same time. Um, actually, four, because Ian Gould came like a year later. So there was Ian Gould, myself, Martin Vernon, Nigel Ross, um, were four players from the MCC who, who went to, to Middlesex. And at the same time, John Embry had just arrived, and then Mike Gatting came. So all of us youngsters were there together. Um, learning our trade in the second 11. So I eventually made my debut in 1974, um, having joined in 1972. Do you remember much about that first game? Or is it a bit of a blur in the dim and distant past now? Well, it, it, it's, it's something I would like to forget. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> okay, it wasn't a pair or was it something like that? <laughs> I tell you what, if the game had gone the full distance, I think it would have been a pair. Um, <laughs> paired on a terrible pitch at Middlesbrough. And um, the pitch just turned. That must have been football. against Yorkshire. We don't have rubbish pitches in Yorkshire. Uh, well, this, I don't think they played at Middlesbrough after that, and I'm quite happy about that. <laughs> but it absolutely turned from the first morning. And um, I remember the game, I think Fred Titmus got about 16 or 17 wickets in the game, and Jeff Cope got about 14 or 15. Um, fortunately for us, Norman Featherston played a superb inning, so it meant that we didn't have to bat in the second innings. Uh, we won the game. I did get a duck um, in that first, in that first innings, and uh, was very pleased not to bat in the second. <laughs> uh, um, I suppose I guess it's just one of those in that you want to tick it off, uh, but you want to get onto your your first score. Really, you're a batsman. You know you want to justify that place. Can you remember your first fifty, first century? Yeah, the, yeah. The first fifty. Well, the next game was um, sorry at Lords. Uh, and I got 50 in that game, so that was my first 50 in, 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 the, in the second game. So I um, didn't get off to too bad a start. I, I described you as a, a middle order batsman. I can remember you, you liking to play your shots, and bearing in mind, just being a little bit younger, I was kind of growing up, you know, as a young lad watching you play on television and that sort of thing. Um, but you, you had a bit of a swashbuckling style, I think. You like to feel bat on ball, am I right? Yes, sir. I was an attacking player, um, you know, as fortunately at that time, Middlesex side, we had um, a couple of attacking players in the middle order, like Mike Gatton and myself. So, um, so we, we, we sort of played around, you know, the likes of Clive Bradley and Mike Burley, who were more defensive and solid players. So we were more the flair players. So that, you know, it worked well for Middlesex. And, and it was a, a great time to be involved at the club, wasn't it? Because, I mean, what a successful period, pretty much from start to finish of your time there. And, well, it went a little bit beyond your time, but there were several one-day trophies under Mike Braley and Mike Gatting, you mentioned. Uh, there was championships as well, and of course then there was a, a call-up to England for you. So it must have been a, a great bunch of lads to be around, and some of those players played for a long, long time, and, and therefore, you know, the backbone of a very strong side. Absolutely. Um, it was a fantastic time. Um, I spent, you know, I finished at Middlesex end of 1990, so uh, from 1972 to 90, and really right throughout my career, the likes of Mike Gatton and John Embry were, was alongside me, and, and a few other players who were there right from the, from the beginning. So, you know, the good thing about that period was that, you know, the faces were the same year in, year out, and um, we were improving all the time, um, success was coming. So really, it was just a case of keeping it going, and something that I really look back with the pride the, these years after. What was it like to play under, for example, Mike Braley, who regularly gets, his name gets thrown up in the talk of great captains down the, the years of, of county and, and test cricket? Well, his name is not used loosely because, I mean, he was a great captain. There's no question about that. I think for me, um, one of the things that really struck me very early was that as a captain, and as a senior player, he, he liked to involve the younger players in what was going on. Um, it wasn't a case of, I'm in charge, I'm the captain, you sit in that corner, do as I say. So really, you know, he, he would often test you on the field. Um, so I remember many times, you know, we'd be fielding as a young player, you want to just come into the side, you know, and he, he would come to you uh, and he would say, well, Roland, um, who do you think we should bowl at, after um, so-and-so at the next end? And it was like, 
you've had to think quickly because you know you would not have been expecting a captain to actually do those type of things but once it happened you know you you would say well i, I think i should follow him with john Embry or somebody you need to keep it tight and um you say yeah i think that's a good idea and he would do it or you say no i don't agree with that i think so and so but what he did was with all the young players he, he he kept them on their toes because once it happens the first time you always made sure that your head was in the game because you felt that at any time the captain would come to you and ask you um, you know what you felt about a certain part of the game and um, how you feel we should proceed so it kept the young players very much on their toes and um, that was very impressive for me because you know as you know most captains don't operate in that manner no uh, um and of course um, Mike Braley regularly gets talked about as part of the reason he gets talked about of being a great captain is is the way he was able to to handle Beefy, to handle Ian Botham in in his test career, especially on the back of him losing the captaincy and of course the eighty one Botham's ashes and all all that. Is that one of these things that is being talked up too much as myth and legend or do you really buy into the fact that he would have been able to, to do that with a player like Ian Botham? Oh, I buy into that big time. And I'll tell you why. I mean, the Middlesex side, if you look at the Middlesex team in terms of individual characters, it wasn't an easy group of, of people. I mean, they were all different um, individuals, you know. Um, you know, and you had the likes of Phil Edmonds and, and people like that in the side who are not the easiest persons in the world to, to deal with, but, you know, really found a way to deal with everybody and motivate everyone. So it did not surprise me that he was able to motivate someone like him to produce the sort of feats that he produced, particularly in 1981. And, and then following on from, from Mike Braley, tough act to follow uh, with the, the would-be captain's armband, if you like, for Mike Gatting, but he'd established himself as a test player. He'd been a little bit in and out, hadn't he, Gat, in, the, in, the, in a test sense. Um, you know yourself, and back in those days, you didn't last for that long uh, if things weren't happening for you. And I think Gat was was quite often one test away from uh, sitting one out and then might get a score and then eventually gets uh, the job as England skipper. But before that, he'd won trophies with Middlesex. What was he like? In how would he compare the pair of them, the two mics? Well, I think, uh, obviously, Gat would have been there right through um, the, the time with really. So he would have picked up um, quite a lot from really. Um, two totally different gar characters, I mean, Gat is a, a bull in the china shop, man. He's up, up front. He's got to lead from the front. Um, so really, all he did was picked up from where Brady um, left off with the same players. Um, we all knew what we wanted to do. We all knew what we had to do. We knew our game inside out. So his job was not um, a particularly difficult one. But, you know, what he did was, you know, he, he, he led from the front and um, he, he became very successful, just like Brady did as captain. Um, also, you know, as, as an England player and as, as an England captain. So he just really continued the, the, the legacy that was set already. And then some of the other players you played with, uh, you mentioned Clive Bradley, you know, what a rock he was uh, at the top of the order for, for Middlesex for, for many years. Um, the likes of Gus Fraser coming in a little bit later on, Mark Ramprakath would have been, I suppose, at the start of his career as you were finishing there. Wayne Daniel, of course, uh, fellow West Indian. Um, we saw what he did at uh, international level, but a tremendous spell as well with Middlesex. Uh, some some absolute quality players coming in there at, um, at different times. I guess when you're winning trophies, it's a happy dressing room. Was it a fun place to be? You know, who were the storytellers and who were the ones who were quiet in the corner? Oh, yeah, it was, it was a fun place to be. I mean, Wayne was one of the biggest, Danny was one of the biggest storytellers. I mean, you know, Wayne would, would hold the, the dressing room spellbound with his, with his stories. Uh, you know, as I said, the dress room had lots of different characters, but the storyteller certainly was Wayne. Um, you know, Clive Radley had been there even before he'd been there from the 60s, early 60s, Clive, Rad Clive Radley, so very experienced player. Um, so, you know, he was able to guide the young players along. Um, you know, John Embry, as you know, you know, he, the sort of person that he is, you know, Edmonds, you know, flamboyant, um, you know, Paul Downton, you know, so, it, you know, the dress room really was a happy one. And of course, for, for a good period of time too, someone like Larry Gomes was there as well as, as, as a Middlesex player as well. So we've had some excellent players 
you know, Jeff Thompson, Vincent van der Boyle, all of these players were, were there certainly during my career. Um, and just looking at your record, 277 first class matches, 428 knocks, just over 12,000 first class runs, just shy, three shy of a double century, the highest score, and uh, averaging over 31. Um, for a start, you've got to be a pretty useful player to hold your place in the side that we've just been talking about. Um, but that's a pretty good record of which you must be very proud. Yes, I'm very proud, particularly in the type of team that I played with, where, you know, from top to bottom, you had a lot of very good players. So, you know, you were coming in um, after um, players have scored lots of runs. So if you think of the runs over the years that Brayley scored and Will Slack and, and Clive Bradley and Mike Gatting, you know, and then I was coming after them. So um, I, I think I played my role in the team. Um, I, I would say that my role in the team really was to be, to be aggressive. And uh, I think it worked well for us. And, um, you know, we were very successful. I had a quick look on the um, Roland Butcher profile on ESPN Crick Info. I better give them a, a little reference. Um, I often do this with players. I've thrown a couple of curveballs. And then, uh, you may have seen it, you may not have, but you may be one of these people who never reads those sorts of things. But it says there, more than once he saved his career with a brilliant hundred. Agree or disagree? Well, I mean, saved. Um... I don't think at any time, it may, it may have looked like that, but at, at no time in my period at Middlesex did um, Middlesex ever say to me, look, there's a possibility of you not getting a contract. So uh, it may have looked so from the outside for persons who felt that I wasn't doing as well as I should do. And then suddenly um, I, I got a good score and then sure that I was there the following year. But um, I mean, I'll be very honest with you. I, at no time at Middlesex during my career, did I ever, from the beginning right to the end, did I ever have anything less than a three-year contract? So I think Middlesex might have been fairly pleased with, with what I was doing for them. <laughs> Let's talk England. Um, what was the build-up to that like? Um, how did you find out you were selected? Did you have to think twice about it, being from where you were from, especially knowing that the tour was going to take you back home. Um, you know, just talk us through all that little episode. Well, I think in 1980, um, I was having a pretty good season in 80. Um, I was playing very well. Um, we played Hampshire um, at Lords. We had a run chase on the, in the afternoon of that game. Uh, I scored 153 not out and we won the game. Uh, then we drove from there up to Scarborough to play Yorkshire. Can't make Scarborough. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, beautiful place, yeah, lovely place. So I followed that up with 179 at Scarborough. And um, so things were going, you know, very well. And then I got picked for the, the ODI, the one international against Australia. Uh, it was a two ODI series where both Alan Butcher from Surrey and myself were picked in that series. Mm -hmm. um, Alan Butcher played in the first one at, he, I think it was the Oval probably, he played in the first one and I played in the second one at Edgebaston. So uh, that was my debut. In terms of how I found out, I mean, it, it was pretty interesting. Uh, I was at Lord's one afternoon, I received a call from my wife who was at work and she said, um, you know, is it true you've been selected for England? And my response was, no, I, not as far as I know, nobody told me anything. She said, well, my boss said that he heard it on the news and she's asking me that. So I, I, I thought, well, no, no one has spoken to me. Then when I got home in the evening, probably about seven o'clock, I received a call from my father asking me the same question. So I still didn't have an answer for him. So it was not until about nine o'clock in the evening when the, the news came on the TV, that I saw that I was selected. So that was the first that I knew that I was actually selected for England in that one international. Uh, even though that I had been at Lords that day training, practicing, and wasn't told a thing. Did you, was that in the days, I mean, did you have to declare yourself, if you like, interested in playing for England? Had we gone through a qualification or anything along those lines, or was that not even an issue? Well, that wasn't an issue for me. I, I, I didn't come into that category because 
I had arrived in England before my 14th birthday. So I, I was, and I was also playing for Middlesex as a home based player. Um, I was not an overseas player. Had I chosen to play for West Indies, then that qualification would have changed. I would have become an overseas player. Um, so really, it was a fairly straightforward thing for me to do. Um, you know, I was married. I had uh, children in England. That was going to be my home. Um, there was no point in trying to play for the West Indies, become an overseas player, then have to compete with um, Wayne Daniel for the one place as an overseas player. So it was fairly straightforward to make that decision. Yeah, so lots of good reasons why you would do it. and Because as a professional, you want to test yourself at the highest level. And wow, that was some level, wasn't it? Two one-day internationals against Australia, just to get you warmed up, if you like, or one, one one-day international. And then off on tour, back to the Caribbean. Um, yeah. Yes, I mean, the, the, the Australia, I mean, the Australian experience, was, it was a good one. A very powerful Australian side, you know, which consisted of Lily Thompson, Pascal, Greg Chappell, Rodney Marsh, Kim Hughes. I mean, it was a pretty good outfit. Um, we did well. We beat them, actually, 2-0. Um, and I actually scored 52 in that first game at Edge Baston, um, which eventually, um, I found out, then became the fastest ODA 50 in international cricket. So that, that, that was a good start for me. And as you said, yeah, the next thing really was... Uh, Actually, after that, we had the, the um, Gillette Cup final, uh, which was in September against Surrey. And, you know, I did pretty well there. I got 50 not out in a winning cause. And we might really got 90 out not out. We beat Surrey. And um, then I went off to, the season finished, I went off to Canada for a holiday. And it was while in Canada, I, I received a call from a journalist. Um, how on earth he tracked me down, I will never know because I never left any directions where I was going, who I was staying with, nothing. But somehow, somebody managed to track me down to my cousin's house in Toronto and to tell me that I'd been selected for England to go on the tour of the West Indies. That was in long before the days of data protection acts and that sort of thing, Roland. So probably <laughs> quite a bit easier then than it would be now to try and find yeah. where you are. <laughs> um, so great, great moment when you get that first call to play international cricket and against, you know, your, your fellow um, countrymen. But it was a strange sort of tour, wasn't it? Because of the Robin Jackman thing in the first place, the Robin Jackman affair, as it gets called, um, in Guyana, um, where after I think you got a bit of a hammering in the first test, or the team did, um, that was abandoned or cancelled, wasn't it, because of his association with South Africa? I mean, what were your thoughts on that at the time, given where you were from and, and all the rest of it, and what your selection stood for from an England point of view? Well, obviously, for me, obviously, I was very excited to be selected um, to go to the West Indies as an England player. Um, you know, we worked very hard during the winter, and then was looking forward, obviously, um, to that. As you said, we arrived in the Caribbean. Um, the Caribbean was a bit of um, it's really tender at the time because the whole South Africa issue was still very much um, in the ear. Um, uh, not a lot was being said, so you know the cricket would have continued. We played the first Test match in Trinidad, and I remember following that Test match. The next Test match was in Ghana, <clears throat> so we went to Ghana. We actually played an ODI in Ghana, and just before the Test match, uh, no, no bother, let's go injured um, in Trinidad and Robin Jackman was sent for to come to Guyana. So Jackman arrived and I don't know, someone alerted the, the then Prime Minister Forbes Burnham that Robin Jackman had previously been to South Africa, etc. And Guyana being perhaps the, the most vocal of the countries at that time, um, revoked his entry permit. So what actually happened then was that obviously the English Cricket Board dealing with the foreign office uh, really decided that if Jackman had to leave that everybody would leave. Um, I must add that you know it wasn't just a Jackman affair because it had happened to me in Guyana previously as a Barbados player. I, I went to Guyana um, as a Bar Barbados player to play for Barbados against Guyana and uh, my opening, I was opening a battle for Barbados and so my opening partner was Jeffrey Greenwich, a white Barbadian who played um, first class for Sussex, and he was a West Indian player as well. And um, Jeffrey Greenwich had been to South Africa before, so 
Forbes Vernon had also asked him to leave. <laughs> and obviously the Barbados government took the stance that if one of their players was being thrown out, then we'd all leave. So when Jackman Fair came along, that was the second time that I had been um, thrown out of Ghana um, and not allowed to play. But I don't think the players minded that too much because it meant that they got to Barbados two and a half weeks ahead of schedule. <laughs> nice break. But from, from, from a personal point of view, um, did you have any, any thoughts or feelings on, on his association with South Africa? Because it wasn't South African, was it? But he was married to a South African woman and had yeah. played several English winters for South African teams. And of course, it was still well within um, the, the apartheid era. Yes, I mean, obviously, as I say, the, the Caribbean was fairly tender at that time. So any, any association, I think, would have um, created that situation. Uh, you know, obviously, from our point of view as players, I mean, it, it made no difference because, you know, we had to re replace the player and he was the one selected to replace him. So, you know, hopefully he would have come and, and, and do a good job. But, you know, as it, as it worked out, um, as I said, we got to Barbados early. Um, I felt I would have made my debut in, in Ghana. Uh, probably wish would have been a good thing because, you know, borders, you know, was a batting paradise. So I would have enjoyed playing there. Uh, but, you know, it also meant that once we moved to Barbados, you know, I would make my debut in Barbados, the place of my birth. So that was also very special. Yeah, I bet it was. And what a great uh, place uh, we played there on the tour that, that I went on. It's a fantastic place. I was then in the 80s. It's better still now. What was it like for you, 1981? Um, turning up back home, what sort of reception did you get from the home support? Was there plenty of ribbing going on? Did, was there any vitriol flying around or was there any pats on the back and saying, well done? No, the support was absolutely fantastic. Not just in Barbados. I mean, the early places that we've been to, because you know, we played a number of lead-up matches in the, in the Leewoods and Winwoods, etc., etc. So everywhere that I went, you know, I was really treated well. I was feted. I was... There was a sense of pride about, you know, the achievement, you know, in Trinidad, uh, you know, they had a butcher re reunion. I didn't know that there were so many butchers in Trinidad. There were hundreds of them who, you know, had parties for me. Same thing in Guyana. Barbados was no exception. Um, most of my family overseas had come in for the test match. My family here, friends, and, and general support, you know, it, you know, it was very much like, you know, our boy, their bat. That was the... You know, that was the headline in the paper. So the support was fantastic. Yeah. And surprising because I, I thought perhaps that, you know, there, there would have been perhaps more um, in favour of the West Indies. But they would have liked myself to have done well. Once, in, once West Indies win, they would have liked that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, crowds, crowds over there are notoriously brilliant and particularly back in those days. And, you know, I alluded to it before. You said the Australian side and listed a few of the greats that you played against in those one dayers. But goodness me, that West Indies side round about 80, 81 uh, through to the mid 80s was surely as good as anything that um, Test cricket has seen. What was it like lining up against um, those, those guys? It was very difficult, I mean, and, and you would expect it because, you know, Test cricket is not easy. But against a team that had blown all countries away over a long period, you know, it was always going to be very difficult. But... You know, we also had a very good side, so it was going to be pretty competitive. It was going to be hard work, but it was going to be um, enjoyable as well. I, I mean, I enjoyed my time here. As I said, it was, it was extremely hard. Um, things didn't go exactly to plan because, as you know, during my first test match, I think on the second day, um, Ken Barrington, our assistant manager, had a heart attack at the, at the hotel, you know, and passed away. So, you know, while making my debut was the greatest thing for me. Uh, by the second day, um, I think the, the overjoyment had turned really to, to something different because you lost a, a, a team member, a teammate, someone who was a terrific guy. Um, and I don't think any of us had really experienced that before. So that was very difficult. But the team that you're talking about, I, I did make a note of it here, of, of the side, just to remind persons of, of the caliber of players that, that West Indies team had at the time. Um, you know, it was Gordon Greenwich, it was Desmond Haynes, Viv Richards, uh, Everton Mathis, Clive Lloyd, Larry Gomes, David Murray, Malcolm Marshall, Michael Holden, Andy Roberts, 
Joel Garner, Colin Croft. That was the 12th um, in, that, in that series. And for me, probably, you know, the strongest team that I've ever played against at any time. And I think many players who played the game would, would say that that was true for them as well. Malcolm, he must have been pretty strong because at the time, Malcolm Marshall couldn't actually get in the side, could he, for that, um, that test match? I think they went with uh, Garner holding uh, and Croft. And you mentioned Everton Mathis. Uh, was that a and yes, and Mar Marshall actually only played in the very last test in Jamaica um, instead of Roberts. But as you said, they went with holding Roberts, Garner, and Croft as as the pace attack. Yeah, fairly, but understandable then with the Ken Barrington issue. Uh, what had gone on in the in Guyana a couple of weeks before, um, and also the fact that they've got that uh, bowling attack that you lost that test match by 298 runs. But I suppose drawing the last couple um, showed that, as you said, you still have a pretty good side yourselves. Definitely. I mean, you know, the team came back really well. And if you look at some of the individual performances, you know, there were some good performances. You know, um, Gooch got 100 in Barbados. Um, Boycott got 100 in Antigua. Really got 100 in Antigua. And then in Jamaica, Gooch got 100. Um, Gower got 100. So, you know, there were some good performances. And uh, yes, I mean, we were a pretty good side. I mean, again, I have made note of that particular team just to give an example of the quality of players that existed in that side. Because, you know, and you would expect a good, a good side, even um, despite the setbacks, you know, to have a bit of pride and, and fight back. And, you know, a side with the quality of players like Jeff Boycott, Graham Gooch, David Gower, Mike Gatton, myself, Ian Botham, Peter Willey, Paul Danton, John Embry, you know, Bob Willis started off the tour, Graham Dilley. You know, you'd expect that with that sort of quality that, you know, there would be some fight back. And yes, um, you know, we did well in those last two set test matches. You mentioned Jeffrey Boycott, and of course your debut was that famous um, over, wasn't it, from Michael Holding to Jeffrey Boycott, um, second, second over of the innings. Yes, that was um, a very, very interesting time. Um, to be quite honest, it was Michael Holden's very first over that he bowled mm. on the pavilion end. And um, just everything really clicked from the very first ball. And um, lots of quick, short deliveries. And as you said, the fifth or sixth ball um, completely bowled Jeffrey Boycott. Something that you know, hadn't happened like that for a long time. And... You know, you speak to Michael, um, you know, I've spoken to Michael many times after that because, you know, we, both of us in 1982, we were the two professional players for Tasmania, the Sheffield Shield. So, you know, we had lots of time to discuss and, you know, we spoke about those things and Michael said, really said, he cannot explain what happened. Just everything just really mm -hmm. fell into place and uh, that over was as it was. In actual fact, you know, if, if you look at the whole test match, there were only two overs that he really bowled with that sort of fire. The next one was his, the very first over of his second spell when Ian Botham was at the crease. Um, and he got Ian Botham out in a similar fashion. But those were the only two overs in that test match that he bowled like that and asked for an explanation. He had none. He just said, it just happened. In the zone. And I'm guessing... There may have been times when you had a bat in your hand in, in whatever form of cricket, county cricket, one day stuff, whatever it might have been, where you, you maybe felt the same. You, you kind of looked at those, look up at the scoreboard and think, Did I, how have I got to that score? Because it's just flown. Absolutely. I mean, and, and, and you just cannot put your finger as on why you're in the zone because if you could, you know, you would do it every day. But, you know, there are times that you just... You just play as if it's unconscious. Things just seem to happen easily. The ball seems to be a lot slower. Um, you seem to find the gaps. And, you know, as I said, yeah, it's very much in the zone, but it's, a, it's something that we all seek. But um, it just comes very rarely and just, you know, gives you a glimpse of, of really what is possible. Yeah. Um, great to, to, to look back on those memories um, of your time playing for England and also for Middlesex. What about West Indian cricket at the moment, and particularly with reference to, to Barbados, given where you are? Um, you know, there's been a, a bit of a resurgence now in the last few years, again, after 
everything felt like it was in the doldrums. People were talking it down. The results were not good. What's your feeling at the moment? Well, I mean, I'll start off with Barbados. In, in Barbados right now, the air cricket is very, very strong. Um, uh, I'm now a selector in Barbados as well, as well uh, as a director. I mean, I've been a director for about eight years on the board, but I'm a selector as well. And this year, um, Barbados actually won the championship this year for the first time in about six years after Ghana won it for the last five years. So, you know, and we won, I think it's five, six consecutive games in, in a row, um, which was fantastic. Um, we've got obviously a very strong side. Um, most of the, a lot of the players, obviously, in the West Indies side. You know, our cricket is, is strong. You know, if you start with the Craig Braffitt, Shea Mosley has been selected for the first time opening batsman. Shamar Brooks, Roston Chase, Shea Hope, um, Shea Dowrich, Jason Holder, Kimar Roach. And then you've got some of the young ones that they've selected as well. Um, Kyle Mears, very exciting young player. I mean, keep an eye out for him. A really talented cricketer. In the, in the Clive Lloyd mode, um, all-rounder, terrific player. Um, and then two young fast bowlers. Um, you got Kimar Holder and Kian Hardin. Um, you know, two good talents who both this year, um, for the fast bowlers in the regional tournament, got, most, got them the most wickets and, and bore really sharp spells and, and, and should do well. So look out for those two youngsters along with Kyle Mears. Uh, so Barbados cricket is, is in good hands. In terms of um, West Indies cricket, um, you know, there is, there is some progress being made. It's going to be slow progress because I think the biggest problem we have is that the, the, the Future Tours program is not the best thing for like a West Indies side. The, this Future Tour program really is ideal for the big three of India, Australia and England. I mean, they're the main beneficiaries. The others really struggle as a result of that. Um, so basically those three get most of the funding while the others struggle, which is not a good thing because you will find over the years to come that you'll have three very good strong, you'll have three strong sides and seven weak ones. And that can be good for cricket in, in world cricket. No. Well, what about the, what's the player pool like there these days? Because again, back when you were playing and when you were touring there with England, it seemed to be an endless conveyor belt and dripping with talent, even though there's a finite size to, to the island. Is it the same now? I mean, we're talking football here. Are you know, people's heads being turned from cricket to other sports? Um, obviously, you, you don't have the same level of reserve talent that you had back in those days. Um, what we do have here in Barbados, so I can speak for Barbados, is we do have um, some young talent in reserve who really could be playing first class cricket in, in another island. Good players. We got, we got some good players um, coming through who perhaps um, at this moment in time not getting the opportunity because of the number of players that we've got in the first team. But, you know, these, these are good young players and I, I expect in the future, you know, to see them coming through. In terms of Caribbean White, uh, we, we don't have that many top, top young players. Um, you know, it's a work in progress. You know, I think in time to come, you know, if, if they can do something about the Future Tours program where West Indies can receive some more money to, you know, invest in their development of the sport, um, then you will see um, much better players. I think something that's held the West Indies back for a number of years is the fact that because of the lack of finance, it's meant that the development of West Indian cricketers really has been very slow because in actual fact, the West Indies run um, on the 15, regional on the 15, regional on the 17, regional on the 19. But there's nothing after on the 19. So most territories who have players in their system from 13 will invest in those players. And then once they reach on the 19, they're literally thrown out to clubs, local clubs, who don't really have the financial resources or um, the, the resources um, human resources to develop those players. So really, in actual fact, what you're doing on a yearly basis, you're taking 100 players on a regional basis and literally throwing them out uh, and saying to the clubs, no, you have now got to bring these players from playing local club cricket into the regional national team. Impossible. So that's been happening for a long, long time. That hasn't helped West Indies cause 
what we have done now in Barbados, um, uh, in Barbados we have the Evening Week Centre of Excellence. I'm the chairman of the Evening Week Centre of Excellence. I've been able to convince my board that that sort of thing has to stop because you know the drain is too much and I've convinced my board to Divert, to have part of the Centre of Excellence under 23 as part of the Centre of Excellence. So we've done that, which meant that players who just came back from the World Cup in the under-19 people like Neymar Bolden and Naeem Young, who played in the under-19 World Cup in South Africa, under normal circumstances, they will be playing for a local club in Barbados as the next protocol while trying to make the Barbados team. So what we've done now is develop under-23 side, uh, We've kept those guys now in the system, so they've got four years really to push to get into the first, first team. And those discussions are also taking place at West Indies level. Uh, I'm on the cricket committee for West Indies, so for the last few years I've been pushing um, that concept of under 23. The problem really has been financed. They just cannot really finance um, another tournament at this time. But what I, what I was able to convince them to do, which they saw the wisdom in, in that they've then put under 23 development side in the first in the 50 over competition mm -hmm. um, and obviously as it turned out this year that team actually won the 50 over competition so you know there, there is progress there and i'm hoping that in time that west indies will be in a position to fund um, a full regional under 23. i think when that happens you will find that west indies players will mature much quicker in terms of when they get into the first class sides and when they get into the West Indies teams. Right now, you know, you're getting into the West Indies team at 27, 28, which is too late. Which brings us to um, a man that we must mention while we've got you on, Roland, and that is, of course, Jofra Archer. 25, I think he is still at the moment, but already a World Cup winner. And I guess the reason he's playing for England is that, uh, not partly born out of the frustration that you're just talking about in terms of how long you have to wait for an opportunity in the West Indies. Absolutely. I mean, he, he really got caught up in that system. Um, he played on the 19, um, did well in the under 19 tournament, probably was one of the top wicket takers. But then the, the team was chosen for the under 19 World Cup and he wasn't selected. So, really, after that, there wasn't a lot for him and there was a lot of frustration. In between, he had some injuries as well. So, you know, that worked to England's favour. Um, the fact that he had an English passport was also a good thing for him. So you've seen what's happened in the last couple of years, really. You know, he's really gone leaps and bounds. As you said, he's got to work up with this medal. He's an he's a England fixture now, and um, things are going nicely for him. Is he somebody you know well, and, and, and are you proud of what he's achieved? Yes, uh, I know him very well. I mean, he's from the same parish as myself, St. Philip. Um, I, I saw Jofa um, as a young player when he was um, certainly playing on the 19, etc. Recognize his talent, and in actual fact, what I did was I contacted Mark Aline at the time, who was the MCC coach, and persuaded Mark to bring him to um, MCC Young Professionals because I, I figured that you know a couple of years there would have been something to develop his game because he, he did look very talented. Uh, that didn't work out because of some family issues uh, between the two families, but um, in the end, you know, he did have a place on the MCC, but, you know, that didn't work out in the end. But from then, I mean, I had seen that, you know, there was um, a level of quality there. But since then, he's shown that, um, you know, he really is a very good fine bowler and he's doing a good job for England. And, you know, long may continue because I think he's a very good regular. And so say all of us. Um, Roland, it's a great way to, to end talking about the, the present. Um, and that connection again between West Indies and, and England cricket, which um, the, of which there's no better example than than yourself having been the first um, black player to have been selected for England. Great to talk to you about all those memories with England and with Middlesex. Um, I think I just want to finish really by asking you for uh, the best eleven that you've lined up with and against. Well, as I said, the. the the best 11 that I lined up against, I said, would have been at West Indies 11. As I said, which was Greenwich, Haynes, Richards, Mathis, Lloyd, Gomes, Murray, Marshall, Holden, Roberts, Garner, Croft. Now, the best Middlesex lineup that I was involved with 
and I've had to name 13 players here because these 13 players were very much part of that period. Rolling, sub rolling substitutions and that's fine. Rolling subs and um, you know we, we were very fortunate during this period that all of these players were international players so um, when, it, when someone came into the side it was just one international replacing another because of injury etc. Uh, I was say so it was Mike Brilly, Will Slap, Graham Barlow, Mike Gatting, Clive Radley, myself, Paul Dunton, John Embry, Philip Edmonds, Mike Selvey, Vincent van der Beyle, Wayne Daniel, Jeff Thompson. <laughs> I think a pretty, a, pretty a pretty decent lineup. Yeah, I'm not sure that Embers and, um, and Phil Edmonds would get too many overs in there because uh, surely Tomo... Uh, Vincent van der Beyl and Wayne Daniel would have blown the opposition away. Well, they, they, they came in and when they wanted to change the ball from one end to the other, then, then they had their spells. But no, they were important part of the teams as well, as you know, both of them were excellent spinners. But that was a very, very strong lineup. And there was no doubt and no question why that team was able to be so successful because I think the quality of players that they had at their disposal um, was very important. Brilliant. Uh, great teams, great memories. Um, Roland Butcher has been an absolute pleasure being my first, would you believe, um, remotely recorded Sporting Lives podcast. So another first and probably the most important one of your sporting career. Well, Jonathan, it's been great talking to you and I thoroughly enjoyed it. You know, and I really hope that it gets the traction that it deserves. Many thanks. Great pleasure.